This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. The podcast making public transit taking kiss stealing wheeling dealing son of a gun tim the nerd welcoming you to another episode of friends talking nerdy part of the deluxe edition network head to deluxe edition network.com to find out about all of the lovely shows including the new ones on the den seated next to me we have the most electrifying professor in podcasting today if i do say so myself we have professor aubrey how you doing Hey there, I'm doing great. I'm a little tired, but feeling good. Yes, tired from two straight weeks of vacationing. (laughs) (laughs) Now, we've already talked about one of those weeks on the show before, but you had another week of vacation in Puerto Vallarta. So, you you make it sound like I took a week off. (laughs) I did not take a week off. I took a long weekend in Puerto Vallarta. Just to be clear, and I didn't take a week off before either. So, why I don't know why you're trying to besmirch me and that besmirch is that a word? Besmirch, besmirch me. I I didn't see that as besmirch. I, I, you know, who wouldn't want to have you know two non consecutive weeks of vacation? I mean, it's like it, it was two weeks. But you had vacation sandwiched in those two-week periods. It wasn't 14 days, but who wouldn't want that? Like, two two fun weekends, right? Yeah, two fun weekends. In opposite sides of the world. (laughs) Yeah, right? Anyway, you're right. I did go to Puerto Vallarta, but actually I just went through the airport there because my destination was a little town called Sayulita. Ah, I only assume Puerto Vallarta because of the Lucha Libre mask t-shirt you got me that had Puerto Vallarta written at the bottom. Right. I got that in Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. And we know what happens when you assume, folks. Anyway, go on. (laughs) So anyway, this little town of Sayulita that every time I mention it to anyone, they're like, oh, I got married there. Or, oh... I took my baby moon there or like whatever, like a lot of people have been there. And it is a Pueblo Magico, which is the same as the town I went to last, not last year, three years ago in Mexico, Todos Santos. Sayulita is in Nayarit, which is a coastal state in Mexico, but it is very, it's like just the other side of Jalisco, which is the count the uh, state that Puerto Vallarta is in. So we actually left the state, but stayed so relatively you, close to the airport. So it was a, a, like a rural part of Mexico? Yes. So we had to drive about an hour, maybe an hour and a half from the airport to the location, to the town. And it was nothing but jungle the whole way. And they have these things called topes, which are really high speed bumps that will mess your car up if you hit them above like five miles an hour were you driving i was not driving i was passenger in a car okay yes (laughs) but my job became to look for the topes because they were the same color as the pavement like how are you supposed to see them they were virtually invisible until you got right up to them but they were designed to slow traffic down and they fucking work and they would have topes wherever there were villages to slow the traffic down it was cool because it was to some extent probably a part of the world that's going to be changing fundamentally and radically relatively soon i mean even just in that experience they were building a new highway and once you build a new highway 
what we learned in the United States is the civilization follows the highway. That leaves towns that are on smaller streets kind of left behind. You know, for folks young enough, they may not be aware that, you know, before we had the interstate highway system here, which was one good thing Eisenhower helped invest in, you know, infrastructure works people, but they did have interstate highways and Route 66, for example, used to be very popular to get from, you know, one side of the country to the other. But now, I mean, it's been years since I've seen like articles talking about little places along Route 66 that don't get the traffic anymore. And that was also the main impetus for the movie Psycho. So it was a rural town. It had a beautiful beach, which is where I spent most of my time. Lounging, collecting the sun. Yeah. yeah, just really hardcore lounging, swimming in the ocean. It was amazing to swim in the ocean. It was so warm. But, you know, back now, back to, back to the work, back to the hum of everyday life. Yes, the kitties missed you that much, is for sure. Yeah? How could you tell? Uh, well, the moment you walked back in the door, they were immediately, you know, by you. Um, but they do that thing that cats are infamous for, of course, the feigned indifference. But, of course, they have to be by you. Uh-huh. It's like they walk by. It's like, oh, you're here now. I'm going to pay attention to this. But then if you're going to walk into the other room, I'm going to run in there real quick and follow the sit, you know. Yeah, so, and of course, uh, you were the one with all the bags. That's right. I had a bunch of bags. Yes, our cats love going in and out of bags, too. Mm -hmm. And the professor has a nice assortment of bags, large, small, and everything in between. (laughs) Yes, I have a lot of bags. And I actually got two new bags, one of which I didn't purchase, but is is a beach bag. Cute. And then I got a bag as a souvenir gift for someone. I won't say who or when. Ooh, mysterious. All right. Mysterio. Yes, a gentleman with the beautiful eyes. (laughs) Now, what would you say is your favorite memory from this trip? It was all just so good. It was. And honestly, I'd say it was taking a nap in the tropics in a really comfortable bed. I mean, that's really what it was all about, was just relaxing. I can imagine, too, um, how awesome that would be, because, like, I've never been to the tropics, but, uh, you know, that time that we, you know, had that hotel room on the beach in Astoria, you're in bed, but you're like, the Pacific Ocean's outside my window, <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's being in, when you're not cooped up in the city, like, I've, I've been a city boy my whole life, first generation city boy, folks, um, so I've not, I'm not used to those type of nature settings or nature sounds outside the window. And I can imagine that is pretty calming experience. Yeah. And I mean, our, our place was close enough to the beach that we could hear the sound of the waves crashing. Always very soothing and restful. Come in me, Aubrey, swim in me. <laughs> That's what it was doing. Well, you know, I had swum and gotten and, you know, hung out in the sun earlier, which was what I was making a nap so nice. Well, it sounds like you had an amazing time. And the beautiful thing about uh, vacations like that are the memories. Of course. Well, me, while you were while you were there, I was dealing with I think it was allergies or something because it's it didn't feel like a cold or a flu necessarily. I mean, because I did, I probably got it from you more than likely. Oh yeah. But yeah, I, I was dealing with that at work one day. Ended up uh, I was outside near the end of the night and. I sneezed really hard, and for whatever reason, my stomach was like, yeah, you know what? Fuck you. I'm going to throw up now. So I go outside, and I throw up on the ground, um, because when you work in that place, it's just like, hose, (laughs) you know? But, of course, uh, one of the dogs was uh, sitting next to me. No, don't say it. Don't say it. I gotta say it. Oh, my God. (laughs) I gotta say it. Everybody knows. You don't need to say it. I, I got to say it. Swim. Okay. Okay. No, I won't say it. I'll edit it in. Okay. How no, about? you can say it. Go ahead. Say okay. It. Well, the dog kind of looked at me with a look on its face like, are, 
are you going to eat that? <laughs> <laughs> so there was that, but also coming down the high from, um, you know, the, the ending of my weekend after Seattle watching WrestleMania. Yeah. And, uh, this may be very much a case of recency bias. Talk to me in a year, two years, five years from now, maybe my opinion will have changed, but in a lot of ways, this presentation of WrestleMania felt like a breath of fresh air. This is truly the first WrestleMania that Vince McMahon had zero fingerprints on, and it showed in a lot of great ways. Now, um, before I go on to my speech, you did actually see Night 2 with me, and I think that is the first time you saw WrestleMania live. Now, we're not going to go a match-by-match -match rundown, but just overall, as, as a casual fan at best, what did you think? You know, I thought it was entertaining. It, it kept my attention, just with the colors and the exploding shit, and just, you know... The thing about watching wrestling is that you're just always like, what's going to happen next? Because it's just more and more absurd, it seems like. Uh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of absurd stuff going on but professional wrestling right now, but that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> and, and I get what you're saying, too. I mean, yeah, with pro, pro wrestling, it's a sporting event in one sense because they are putting a physical act doing a physical activity out there but they're also telling a story as well so it's merging both of those and in a lot of ways it has to be i mean it's entertainment at its most base but i think the match of the weekend had to have been the main event of night two and that was cody rhodes versus roman reigns and what I loved about that more than anything was the long-term storytelling that came to a close at that particular moment for longtime fans like me being able to have those little threads that you see like, Ooh, I remember that. Ooh, I remember that, you know, makes it that much more exciting to, to be into it. Um, but it had to do with all of the run-ins that happened in the match being that this was a bloodline rules match. Roman could have any member of his stable show up. And so people were wondering how was Cody Rhodes going to respond? And in the match, uh, the very first interference was from Jim Jimmy Uso, part of the Bloodline, he used to be part of a tag team called the Usos with his brother Jay, but um, Jay ended up turning on the Bloodline and becoming a good guy. Huh. And the previous night before, he actually had a fight with, with his brother that I believe Jimmy ended up winning, but uh, Jimmy ended up trying to stop the match, but Jay comes out, stops his brother, and then there's a big spear off the stage onto some tables that were prepared for them. Of course, it was a prepared spot, folks. Right. But... I loved that bit of storytelling right there. The next thing they did was brought out a gentleman by the name of Solo Sokoa, another member of the Bloodline, who attacked Cody Rhodes, similar to what happened at last year's WrestleMania, performed his finishing move on him and had Roman try and pin him. Roman did, but got a two count. And Solo got upset, but then at that point, John Cena comes out. What the heck? Now... A few months previous at one of the Saudi Arabia shows, Solo Sokoa actually had a match against John Cena and pinned him clean in the ring. Mm -hmm. And so this was Cena getting his revenge. Mm. Long-term storytelling there, folks. And, and again, very simple stuff, but... You know, it when that happens and it's done in a logical way, the payoff is is amazing. But then at that point, once Solo Sokoa is out of the way and it's just John Cena in the ring, all of a sudden, out comes The Rock. The Rock and John Cena at WrestleMania's 28 and 29 main evented both shows. And um, they've had a feud in the past. Mm -hmm. So The Rock came out, ended up giving the rock bottom to John Cena. You know, again, more long-term storytelling. But Cena is out of the ring. Then, out of nowhere, you hear the music of The Shield play. And you're like, who is The Shield? Uh, the Shield started in about 2012. It was a faction that included Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, who you know as John Moxley now in AEW, and Roman Reigns. And a couple of years after The Shield first started, Seth Rollins actually turned on Roman Reigns by hitting him in the back with a chair. Mm. So Seth Rollins actually got, you know, ran to the ring with a chair to try to stop what was going on with Cody, but Roman Reigns cut him off. And um, from there, 
No, no, that happened. But slightly before that, The Rock had to be out of the ring. Um, so, you know, The Rock was doing his thing about ready to whip Cody Rhodes. And then, gong, The Undertaker shows up. The lights go out. The lights turn back on. The Undertaker's just magically behind The Rock. Choke slams him. The Rock's out of commission at that point. Then from there, um, I did have the order of events correct. Seth Rollins uh, ends up getting up again. It's just Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns, and Seth Rollins, who were the active ones in the ring. And remember, I had told you that when Seth Rollins had turned on the shield and become a bad guy back, back in 2014, I believe, he hit Roman Reigns in the back with a chair. Mm -hmm. At WrestleMania 40, Roman hit Seth Rollins in the ring with a chair, and it was that that cost him the match. Because right after that, Cody ended up catching him on, on something, performing his finishing move, and then getting the win. So the um, the long-term storytelling for a lot of stories paid off in that match, which I, you know, for me, a longtime fan, it is nice to see a wrestling company rewarding fans like me that, you know, are able to, you know, identify, oh, this happened with this story and this happened with this story. It's all coming together, you know. Let me ask you a question about all this that I don't think I understand. Yeah. Now, are, are there writers for this stuff? Yes, um, but they also have a booker as well. Basically, uh, the writers will pitch ideas. Um, and then, you know, you have producers, which were former wrestlers, that will kind of work it out with the wrestlers themselves. But, yeah, um, in the past, they've used soap opera writers on the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. um, they've, you know, so, yeah, they do have a team of writers coming up with all of the storylines. It's not like it used to be back in the day because a booker back in the day, all they had to, I mean, they put the match together and then, you know, told you would tell the wrestlers like you're facing person x you have to sell out you know this coliseum you know blah 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 and you got three minutes to you know come up with something whereas today um depending on who it is of course you either will have a full script of what you're supposed to say or if you're a proven commodity on the mic in terms of improvising you'd be given bullet points but yeah i mean the, there is a i mean while there's a one person at the top triple h Paul Levesque now, uh, he's going by his real name, um, who who gives the a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether something is going to happen. There is a team of creatives behind it that are coming up with the stories. And, and they're, you know, not wrestlers. Not always. There are some that have been wrestlers before um, that, you know, are the, like Paul Heyman, for instance. Oh, right. You know, he's, uh, you know, the, not only Roman Reigns manager, but behind the scenes, one of the uh, best creative minds in professional wrestling history. Right. Okay. So, you know, I think what's interesting about that is you don't like you hear about writers on sitcoms. But you don't hear about writers on wrestling or, you know, I was just trying to think of like other things where it seems like it's actually happening, but it's not actually happening. Well, I, there are some writers of professional wrestling that wrestling fans are aware of. They're like wrestling famous Mm -hmm. You know what okay. I mean? I've used that term around you before. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, like, you, you throw a couple names around, I may know them, but that doesn't mean you would, of course, because for the longest time with WWE under Vince McMahon, there have not really, unless they absolutely had to, ever been, like, ending credits on a TV show. It will just end with a copyright notice. Mm. Um, for some of the early shows in the 80s, for whatever reason, uh, at, depending on the show, you would have ending credits, but for the most part, you don't know. And, you know, I, I think a lot of that was based on the ego of the person who's no longer involved with the company because mm. people would, you know, if things were going good, he gets the praise. If things are going bad, it's the writers. Right. Yeah. So a lot of times, writers in, in among professional wrestling fans, they should be critiqued for their bad ideas, and there are a lot of bad ideas out there, but I think a lot of times they end up being uh, being scapegoats for the person that ultimately makes a decision on whether something should hit the screen or not. Right. And what you appreciated about the the through lines from 
the past and the future indicates that either the they've been the same writers for a really long time or they have gotten to know the history and the all the stories yes i mean at the end of the day any i mean there aren't many wrestling fans that are going to, it, it there are the same amount of professional wrestling fans who think it's real that walk into a Chris Angel performance and think he has demonic powers. Right. You know, I think most people going in understand that, you know, they're seeing a performance and, you know, they're going to suspend their disbelief. They just don't want to be insulted. Right. And obviously with professional wrestling, for, like, I, I love it. I make, I make no bones about that. I love it. But I also understand, too, it's not the most intricate form of entertainment out there, you know. <laughs> so it, it doesn't take much to please professional wrestling fans. But I think at the end of the day, when you have long-term storytelling like that, that has a definite beginning, middle, and end that you can see, it just makes it to where... It, it's much easier to sus to suspend your disbelief and get emotionally involved to support the person that you want to cheer on and boo the person that you hate. So bringing it back to this match, who who was the person that you hated? When I say hate, I'm talking about hate in terms of how you would hate Darth Vader in in Star Wars. You know, you you like the character, but you don't want him to win. <laughs> you know, right, 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 right. Type of deal. So Roman Reigns, I wanted Cody to win. I mean, like, this is another thing about being a long term wrestling fan is the, I mean, you, f you end up feeling old on the one hand, but too, like, I, when I was a kid, that was around the last big heyday of the man who wined and dined with kings and queens and slept in alleys and dined on pork and beans, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes, his dad. Right. You know, I grew up, uh, you know, watching him. So, you know, having Cody end up winning the match was just like his dad would be so proud. Before I end, there was actually one story that happened afterwards. Once uh, Cody came back uh, into gorilla position uh, uh, from the audience, the Triple H ended up giving him a gift. What was that? It all starts. I have to go the long way because it's it was kind of a sentimental gift for Cody. But it all started after Cody and his sister, uh, you know, graduated from high school, and um, you know, didn't know exactly what they wanted to do uh, in life, but they knew they wanted to, you know, get involved in something. So their dad at one point sat them both down and said, "Hey, I made some calls. I know some people out in Los Angeles, so you can go out and take acting school. Here's ten thousand dollars for the both of you." What Cody ended up finding out after the fact was that one of uh, Dusty Rose's possessions was a Rolex watch. Mm. The family at the time didn't have much money. Cody and his sister didn't know that. Dusty pawned the watch, got the $20,000 to give to both of them. And what happened is because it's a Rolex, you know, because there are more identification marks on a Rolex compared to a Timex, um, something like that. After a little investigation, they found that watch mm. and gave it to him as a gift. Wow. So all around, just good, happy feelings. And being in also having WrestleMania 40 ending with the announcer yelling at the top of their lungs, I love pro wrestling. <laughs> like never would have happened under under vince mcmahon and i'm i'm well i i'm not offended by the term sports entertainment that is too vague because the harlem globetrotters are sports entertainment yeah they they just are they're i mean they're athletes that are putting on an athletics uh exhibition under the pretenses of a story yeah you know so going you know calling themselves and being proud of calling themselves you know pro wrestling and pro wrestlers and all that stuff is just like the stuff I grew up on in the eighties is back, and that makes you happy. It does because I mean, wrestling's on fifty-two weeks out of the year, so there will be peaks and valleys. And this show, if you go back into our archives, folks, there have been plenty of times where I've bitched about the valleys. But when the peaks occur, um, there's no better feeling than than it's. I mean, it would be like you getting front row seats to a Bob Dylan concert mm. in his prime. You know? <laughs> right, back in 1968. Yeah, so it 
Yeah, like I said to folks, recency bias may be involved here. Um, you know, like a year from now, five years from now, my opinion will definitely change. You know, because I remember watching uh, episode two, Attack of the Clones, in theaters and coming out like this was a great movie. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, that changed rather quickly. Like my opinion of Kid Rock, but hey, we did a lot of bad things in the two thousands, folks. <laughs> Lots of bad things. Yeah. Anyway. Before we get to our main event, how about we send it to one of our friends at the Deluxe Edition Network? That sounds like a great idea. All right, sit back, relax, and enjoy this message. Welcome to the Growing Up Bananas podcast. My name is Ethan. This is my co-host, Sam. What are we doing here? The podcast will explore the internal battle of not just Asian immigrants, but every immigrant, whether it's staying true to thousands of years of culture that our parents passed on to us and their parents passed on to them, or assimilating to what we see around us. So why is it bananas? Well, a banana was a slur used for an Asian person who'd lost touch with their heritage. Yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Growing up is hard enough as it is, and we find ourselves in a situation where we're not quite Asian enough for the Asians, and unfortunately aren't able to change the colour of our skin. Unless you're MJ. Well, that's true. We've been thinking about it, and as travel becomes more accessible, the world will become more intertwined. With that, the number of people who go through the same ups and downs of living in a foreign country, like we did, will rise. We want to share these experiences with you. Throughout the journey, we're inviting a series of guests to share their compelling stories with us. We hope to have the likes of Dami Yim, Jeremy Lin, Jackie Chan, and Han Do. You'll hopefully join us as guests along the way. Follow us on socials to stay updated with Growing Up Bananas, and we look forward to sharing our stories with you. Hey, Tim, before we get to our main event, would you like a cup of coffee? Always. I live on that stuff. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. How do I get through the day otherwise? Caffeine, man. Caffeine is the way. Yeah. I agree. You've got to have caffeine in order to make it through the day. That is for sure. Um, so I have this new coffee I would love for you to try because I absolutely adore it. And you know, I have a really good taste in coffee. You most definitely do, folks. Yeah. So I have this new coffee from Coffee Brothers Coffee, Coffee Bros. And they are a small roaster in new york city that's run by two brothers which is why they call themselves coffee bro imagine that i know right and they have this really great website that sells coffee that they make there in new york city or they roast there sorry they don't make it there obviously they grow it in places where coffee grows yeah, I don't think the South Bronx is a good place for coffee. No. In terms of growing coffee. No, I think you have to be much closer to the equator. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, here, I give it a try. What do you think? No, 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 no. So good, folks. So good. This is something I recommend we all try. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, it's an award-winning coffee... And it's got really great blends, espresso roasts, and single origin coffees, which are all small batch roasted, you guys, in New York City. And we're in Portland, as you know, the home of amazing coffee. But for my coffee at home, I'm going to go for Coffee Bros. And a reason I would go to Coffee Bros myself is because I love a good discount. Oh my god, yes you do, Mr. Frugal. Yes, if you go to their website, which you can go to our show description, and it will have a link there that will take you directly to their site, coffeebros.com. If you purchase in, uh, purchase some coffee from their website, and at the when it prompts you to put in the promo code, you put in FTN10, you're going to save 10% off of your order. Wow, that's awesome. It definitely is. I Well, I hope everybody takes advantage of this wonderful opportunity to get 10% off this fabulous coffee. I hope so, too. Again, people, coffeebros.com. You can find a link in our show description. And at checkout, in the promo code area, put in FTN10. Let's drink some coffee, baby. Okay. <laughs> At Friends Talking Nerdy here, there have been times to where we've discovered unintentional theme months. Mm-hmm. And what we've found this past month here, with this pa- these past few episodes that we've had, is that 
the professor and I have been kind of diving back into time. And it's been a fun reminiscing um, about the past and everything. And what I thought would be fun here, too, is to kind of discuss some of the albums in one of the most unique years in music history, 1991. And why was that such a unique year? Well, obviously, if you go back a couple episodes on the show, there was one particular album uh, from a group called Nirvana called Nevermind that dropped in 1991 that we're still kind of talking about today, of course. Of course we are. Um, And its impact, but I felt it would be fun to kind of give an overview of just a, a little sprinkling of what was happening in 1991 because... I don't think Nirvana was a single entity. It wasn't like a sudden bright light in the darkness. I think that there was stuff channeling in the music industry that um, was was giving clear indication that what was working in the past was no longer going to work. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, 1991 musically kind of showed in a lot of ways, just where music was going to go, go uh, in good ways and bad, unfortunately. But I thought it would be fun to kind of go through a list here of some of the albums uh, released that year, talk about some of the songs that are on that are on those particular albums that we remember, and just do what we've been doing the past few weeks and reminisce. How does that sound? That sounds wonderful. Before we dive into it, 1991, where were you at? I was in high school. I was a junior in high school, and um, I was in Tennessee being a junior in high school, which is pretty miserable. Where were you? I was in Michigan at the time. I was a freshman in high school. At the start of the year, finishing up eighth grade, thinking eighth grade was worse, but at least high school is going to come here. Oof. (laughs) That ended up not being fun after the fact. But, you know, one thing that was always there at the end of a bad school day was MTV. And at that, in terms of popular current music at that particular time, I think MTV was a good smorgasbord of, of music that you can get throughout all hours of the day. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, radio stations had a niche and, it, you know, MTV didn't have a niche. Like there was something for everyone. Maybe, you know, there was more for white people. But <laughs> true, um, I, I, you know, the very fair argument, uh, you know, at least in the early days, I think by the time, you know, record company executives started seeing, oh, this rap stuff is making us money, <laughs> you know, then uh, things changed real quick because can, it, it's, isn't it funny how racism suddenly disappears once, you know, there's some money, money involved. involved. Yeah, you know, I mean, it happened in wrestling too. In Tennessee, a guy by the name of Sputnik Monroe, professional wrestler um white guy sputnik sputnik monroe that was his 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 performing name um ended up getting uh such a fan base in the black community that he was able to tell perf- uh, the the promoters that i am not gonna wrestle in tennessee unless the crowds are integrated mm. and money happened after that and you know so hey professional wrestling did some good yeah, that's awesome. I had no idea. Yeah, I, I, I can show you a little more about the guy later. But how about we dive into some of the albums from 1991? Yeah, let's, let's dive in. All right. First album I wanted to mention here. It's kind of clear when, you know, hindsight being 2020, when something is meant to be a one-hit wonder. And I think for this particular band, that was going to be the case. The Divinals. When I think about you, I touch myself is the big hit off that album. Any thoughts on the Divinals? You know, what can you say about that song? It's, It's a great song. And they're just like a few songs like that, like She Bop from Cyndi Lauper and The Prince One. Green Day. Oh, yeah, Green yeah, Day. Yeah, they have a masturbation song. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, the, I remember, like, the video would come on, and if my mom was home, she would start laughing, and then the way she would laugh, like, I didn't know what she meant at the time, and but I still knew that I shouldn't be you know i should be grossed out by my mom laughing like that. <laughs> so 
uh, there was that. Uh, the song itself, like I said, has you know if people like it that's great and, and you know and if they're still touring that's good for them too i mean i'm always going to support anybody making a paycheck in the arts whether you got a crowd of five people or five thousand or more but you know yeah this was a one-hit wonder you know that's one more than i have folks you know and i've tried no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> you've never put a single out you never made a record <laughs> it can't go on from there but any other thoughts on the Defiant Walls? No. Okay. The next one here is from a gentleman by the name of Gerardo. He had an album called Mo Ritmo, and the big single off of that was Rico Suave. Oh, my goodness. One of the few songs that could probably get you herpes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so damn cheesy. This is another one-hit wonder deal, but... At the very least, you can laugh at how over the top it is, and you can just imagine somebody actually believing that they were like a Rico Suave type of person and acting like that in a video. But it was just so, in some ways, I would like to give it credit enough to think that it was making fun of people like that. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, kind of like the Beastie Boys first album, you know, where they thought they were goofing on the jocks and then they found out the jocks started loving the music. They were like, yeah, we didn't make it clear enough. You know? Right. We we don't like you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm hoping best case scenario there was that. But um don't be sad for him though. Apparently, while he did not have much in terms of a career, you know, putting out CDs and whatnot, he ended up working in you know behind the scenes in the music industry. And I believe he was the guy who helped uh facilitate Ricky Martin, you know, getting a contract with an American record label and you know, come in coming out with music from there. So, you know, he definitely found success in other ways. Um, you know, which is the beauty of the music industry. I mean, they're like Linda Perry from Four Non Blondes. Who would have thought that that one hit wonder from the song What's Up, the woman who sang that, ended up writing songs for Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, and other people and making more money than she could ever dream of doing that than with Four Non Blondes? Yeah. Anyway, any thoughts on Gerardo? Um, no. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I really don't remember that song except that it was a joke yeah yeah uh, i mean kind of it was like a name that you called people yeah uh, in, a, in a lot of ways it was like uh the baby got back thing right you know you know fun you can have a quick laugh but also too this is kind of like a you know kind of like a jeff foxworthy thing you know like you you first time you hear the you might be a redneck jokes you're laughing the ninth time you hear it, the 27th time you hear it, not so funny after that, you know? Right. You need your comedians to have more than one act. Yeah. Get her done. Anyway, anything else? <laughs> no. All right. Moving on, the next album here is the last album from Queen with Freddie Mercury on vocals, Innuendo. A couple of the big hits off of that album are These Are the Days of Our Lives and The Show Must Go On. Not much more to say there. Like, would people probably put this at the top of their most exciting Queen albums? Probably not, but in a way, too, like, knowing a little bit of the story of what was happening at that particular time, like, he knew he was passing. And he wanted to be able to have just, you know, one final great Freddie Mercury type performance and uh, ended up doing it. The album itself, I believe, is just a little on the melancholy side, but understandable. You know? I was going to say, was had he passed before it came out? Yeah. Um, and so some of those songs, like you just said, the two names of the songs, which sound like, you know, reminiscent songs. Yeah. And also, the, like, with the show must go on. I mean, I, I think, you know, while some people may have questioned why Queen would go out with Paul Rogers uh, from Bad Company on vocals as lead singer of Queen, uh, and then, you know, currently go out with Adam Lambert. 
Oh, wow. uh, as as le- as lead singer, it's not that they're you know necessarily you know going forward like you know like ACDC did with with Brian Johnson after Bon Scott passed away and creating new stuff. I mean, the show. I, I think Freddie would have been happy that you know the guys that still want to be involved in Queen, not the drum, or not the bass player. Uh, he's not been involved since Freddie passed away. Oh, um, but that they've gone on and had fun and you know did their thing and Brian. May is now, I believe, an astrophysicist too. Wow. Yeah. Smart fella. But anything else about Queen? You know, I you know, I love Queen. This album I'm not familiar with. Like I like I said, I was a junior in high school and I was a girl. And none of this is what I was listening to. Well, I'm sure you may have been listening to this next one. What's that? From a little band out of Georgia called REM. Out of Time was released in 1991. Um, you have Losing My Religion and Shiny Happy People among the big hits off of that album, among others. But again, 91, this was very different from your Poisons, from your Def Leppards. And the fact that a song in 1991 that started off with a mandolin could hit <laughs> have a... Uh, uh, you know, have have a number one album and a number one song with a mandolin in it, you know, says a lot for the fact that people wanted something different. I mean, R.E.M. had a fan base, but this is the album that, you know, really made them mainstream big. Yeah, uh, I was listening to that for sure. And um, they had, they put out a greatest hits album right after they, you know, had the big commercial success, right? And they put out this album of songs that they had done before they were famous. And uh, it was really great, too. They're definitely a great band. Um, my absolute favorite in the world, no, but I, I would put them in the greatest hits category. You know, they have enough uh, great songs that I enjoy that, you know, that I, I can put together on my own playlist now, thanks to streaming, or if they had a decent Greatest Hits album out. But, you know, Losing My Religion, I loved how the religious folks I grew up with uh, in, in uh, Grand Rapids were trying to, you know, to talk about how this song was this whole thing about how people should give up religion and how that's a bad thing, when at the end of the day... Michael Stipe, growing up in Georgia, had a southern southern grandma who used the phrase "losing my religion," which was apparently an old phrase in the twenties that people said in the South when they talked about losing their mind. Right. So, not yeah, yeah. People like to read into things. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Yeah. Well, other things were going on with cigars around nineteen ninety one too, weren't they? No, that was about five years after ninety six. I know, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it all started in 91. Yeah, the t- campaign, baby. Yeah. Great times. Great exactly. times. All right, anything else about R.E.M.? Um, no. All right. The next one here, I am I know for a fact you ended up uh, getting this. The Bob Dylan Bootleg Series, volumes one through three. Yes, loved it. Got the box set, I think, for uh, some birthday, 16 or 17, I don't know. And, um... Loved it so much. I mean, that's really my introduction to Bob Dylan. Like, that's what I started with. And this is around the era where CDs were really becoming more mainstream than they were in the past, which allowed great box sets like this to actually exist. I mean, I don't think people were going to buy, like, an eight-cassette box set of uh, anything apart from an audiobook. And even then, that would be, un- th- you know, that was unwieldy. But, you know, this was his attempt at kind of killing not necessarily killing off the bootleg market of stuff that's out there but you know giving people higher quality audio than what they would get from some of the bootlegs if uh you know they were able to buy it off the bootleg market yeah anything else about this you want to relay yeah it's just it was an amazingly significant piece of music in in my life that's all okay well there you go We'll move on here to the next one from Lenny Kravitz. It's the album Mama Said. Uh, The two big hits off of that are the uh, songs Always on the Run, which had uh, your favorite guitar player Slash guest starring on there. Uh, And the song It Ain't Over Till It's Over, the song that Lenny Kravitz wrote as an apology to Lisa Bonet when she found out he cheated on her. 
for the first time of many times, right? I, I wouldn't put it past him. I am only aware of the one instance to where he had an affair with the woman who uh, he co-wrote the song Justify My Love uh, for Madonna for. Ah. Yeah, so uh, again, it's Lenny Kravitz people. I think there are a lot of women who would st- st- throw themselves at, at throw themselves at him today. So um, again, I wouldn't be shocked if he had multiple, um, you know, cheating spells. Um, I wouldn't approve of it, of course, but it just wouldn't shock me. But I can, you know, I only know of the reason he wrote that song was because of that one incident. I understand. Well, you know, I really liked this album uh, when it came out, and I may have even had it. I don't know. It seems like on the cusp of something that I might buy. Yeah, with the cool black and white cover, and he's in the like the hippie outfit. With yeah, anyway. I didn't. I didn't own that album then. If that does not sound familiar. <laughs> yeah, me with my great descriptions, folks. But anything else on Lenny Kravitz? Nope. All right, the next one here. Yeah. Michael Bolton, Time, Love, and Tenderness. Uh, his cover album of old R&B songs. Um, the only thing I can really say to sum up how, just how awful that was, and we watched this clip before we started the recording here, was Beavis and Butthead's reaction to it. Uh-huh. You know how Beavis was like, ah! Oh, turn it off, turn it off. And then Butthead immediately starts joking that, oh, wait, does, is this a coffee commercial? <laughs> and they started making jokes off of there, um, including, I think it was Jean Pierre. I think there was a commercial uh, around that time, a coffee commercial to where like two women were, you know, said something along the same lines, but just Michael Bolton. Awful, awful, awful. He was a failed heavy metal star from the early 80s, hair metal band, that ended up just doing this crooner crap. And, you know, obviously more power to him. He's made his money, but just no integrity in this whatsoever. Like, he's just a shill with a good voice and an empty, mush, mushy head. That's really, you know, you don't usually get so hepped up about things, but... Yeah, I mean, if if you're friends with the guys in Kiss, then maybe you're not a good guy. <laughs> you know? Maybe not. Yeah. Anything else on this lovely album? No, I try to avoid it as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, this. Yeah, like this is the stuff that like our parents or people slightly older than our parents were probably getting. You know, their their panties in a bunch over if they were listening. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's sort of like Michael Bublé of that earlier era. Ew. Anyway, let's move on here. We have the debut album from a group called Boys to Men. And we've actually referenced this album on the show before. Um, I believe it's a right around our Christmas, uh, our Christmas episode when we talked about Eric Monte, Cooley High Harmony. Uh, with the hits, It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday and End of the Road. Good band, good band. They actually sang America the Beautiful at WrestleMania 15. Really? And they got booed. (laughs) Why'd they get booed? Because it was the Attitude Era and Philadelphia has really hardcore fans. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. But, you know, great vocals. Were they ever anything that I was going to be like, oh my God, they're the greatest? No, but that doesn't mean that I don't you know, respect, you know, the work that they've put in. I mean, they're, they're good. And, you know, I, I believe they're still out making money. So good for them. Yeah. 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 But they're like a middle school dance band. That's what I think of. Yeah. Like, the end of the road. Like. Yeah. Like, like, or when, you know, it must've been, cause this was 91. It was like, that was the song of graduation year. Right. Yeah, I mean, I could just imagine my sister at home, you know, like listening to the radio when she was making Colleen's cool cassettes. Oh, she ripped that off for me. She um, totally ripped that off from you. Yeah, I should have sued her anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think she was putting on some boys to men and listening. I wish a boy would sing this to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else on boys to men? No, love them. All right, the next album here. 
Natalie Cole, the album Unforgettable with Love. This is the album to where, you know, similar to what the Beatles did, uh, you know, whether it be recently or with the anthology album, um, she took original vocals from her dad and sang along with it. That is a very simplistic way of putting it. I mean, she made it sound good, um, you know, put it that way. But in a lot of ways, that album was like our generation's introduction to Nat King Cole. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for that, even though I'm not going to rush out and listen or buy this album, you know, good for her for that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I remember that album was just so good because those songs are just so good. Th- yeah. I mean, th- there are songs in the American songbook that, you know, hopefully will fade away with the dust of time, you know, but there are also some that you know, will always stand the test of time. And when you have a good singer putting vocals and emotion behind it, you know, it it's going to be great. And this is one of those instances to where you could forgive her. You can forgive her for doing it to where it would be completely wrong for somebody else to do that, you know, in terms of a non family member or a non, you know, like band member or something doing vocals for somebody who's passed away. Yeah. You know, if there's no connection, when you have a connection like this and the reason for it is, is, you know, you know, good, uh, like this is, then you can't go wrong. And she won a lot of awards. (laughs) Yeah, she really did. Yep. All right. Move on to the next one here. This album is where I learned that the word fuck is an acronym. Really? Yes. From a little group called Van Halen for unlawful carnal knowledge. Uh, Some of the big hits right now, Pound Cake, Top of the World. Uh, For fans of Van Halen that are primarily fans of the David Lee Roth era of that band, this is the one album that they will say, but I like this. You know? Right. Um, I mean, like growing up, I was, uh, you know, I became aware of them more during the, what they call it, the Van Hagar era. And in a lot of ways, it was kind of a different band compared to, you know, what they did with David Lee Roth. But do you have any thoughts on the Fuck album? No, I mean, I was, if I was ever a fan of that band, it was definitely during the David Lee Roth era. Yeah. Just a gigolo, really, is the one I remember the most. Uh, that was actually from David Lee Ross' uh, solo EP after he left Van Halen. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah. But, same, yeah, it was, that was like a year after 1984, so. Right. Yeah. All right. I'll move on to the next one then. Okay. All right. We have uh, kind of a surprise hit, but... This is a person who put in a lot of work in the music industry over the years. Um, I'm not aware of her having a hit comparable to this before this time or necessarily afterwards, but it's one that, you know, anybody our age, when you hear the song title, something to talk about, you're going to think of Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Luck of the draw. Like I said, she's uh, has a long tenure uh, in, in music, and I think, we should, you know, this is right yeah for as far as mainstream success this was her you know like high world on bonnie ray type of deal yeah. you know i mean like she's still playing like the house of blues type of theaters which are great venues uh to play for you know music artists today because of this album yeah not that she wouldn't uh beforehand but it helps you know yeah of course i mean she's like legitimately famous mm-hmm. like everyone knows who she is like compared to most people who are playing those venues, she's definitely the most famous of them, don't you think? Uh, no, but the, the, the like the House of Blues type of the theaters do get some pretty big name acts. Like they're not going to get like the Rolling Stones necessarily, but the Rolling Stones, um, if they want to do like a warm up gig, uh, which they do at, at smaller theaters sometimes, would generally pick a, th- a theater that size. You're t- talking about. Like uh, four to six thousand seats, maybe. Mm. So it's interesting. That's the 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 size of music venue that that corporation's trying to bring into Portland. Uh, Live Nation. Yeah, Live Nation. Yeah, that's the size we're missing, apparently. Uh, yeah, all for all Ticketmaster. Fuck them. Anyway. Yeah. Anything else about Bunny Ray? No. 
Yeah, I mean, great song, something to talk about. Yeah, like the, the rest of her catalog didn't really speak to me personally, but if somebody gave me free tickets to see her in concert, I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. How about I go on to the next one here? We have from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Into the Great Wide Open, which has the hits Into the Great Wide Open and Learning to Fly. Loved it. Had it. Listened to it. This was an era where Tom Petty could really do no wrong. Yeah, I mean, th- and I think the videos were great. Mm-hmm. I think that's what interests me the most about the band. Like, the music itself wouldn't have hepped me up. But it was the music with the videos that made me think they were really creative. Oh, right. I think that's going to be a good cutoff mark right here. Um, But we do have a number of other entries that I would love to talk about. So how about we do that next week? We have a part two. Ooh, part two. Keep people on the edge of their seats. I know, folks. But, uh, you know, any chance that we have to talk about music on this show. I'm going to take advantage of it because music is life. Music is life. Yeah, absolutely. And it will, you know, the older you get, it also becomes a great time machine too, because you can hear certain songs and then immediately you're in certain locations of where you were at when you were a kid. And, you know, the older you get, the more stuff like that occurs. Uh, neural nostalgia, I guess is what they call it. Yeah. Yeah. In actual term, folks, the, you know, hey, my internet browsing came to... I mean, it's got to be something that increases our chances of survival, right? Because survival of the fittest. And that's kind of an evolutionary kind of thing. And when you have great musical tastes like we do here, you're going to be fit for a long, long time. (laughs) All right. So anything else you want to say to our lovely friends at home before we wrap things up for the night? No, just I hope you have some music that you enjoy from another time, and maybe you can sit back and reminisce about that. Indeed, and if you are catching this on YouTube Music, uh, feel free, or any other uh, service that you're listening on, feel free to drop us a line, let us know what you're listening to, what you liked from 1991, what you didn't like, uh, what you agree with the song, what you disagree with the song, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. All right. So, for the most electrifying professor in podcasting today, each Monday we'll have something in this podcast space to entertain your ear holes. Until we meet again, we bid you adieu. So long. When I think about you, people at home, I touch myself. (laughs) Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on YouTube Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Goodbye, darling.